Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. Woo! Woo! I am just curious, how many of you are an extrovert? Do I have any, any extroverts in this room? Could you just help me wave a little palm? I just feel like, in fact, would you mind just passing them out? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, we're not doing a ceremony or anything. I just thought it would be fun. Yeah, who, who, who's my extroverts? Ra- raise your hand, there's a catch his eye. Oh, yeah, yeah they're, and the extroverts are raising their hand joyously already. They didn't even need a palm branch, man. They're already on it. That's so great. I love it. Well, happy Palm Sunday. Hosanna. <laughs> do, you, do you even know what Hosanna means? It means save now. Lord, we need you. Come rescue us. Help us, Lord. So how about one, one quick, uh, once, as soon as we get those, oh, almost there. There we go. How about one big Hosanna on three? One, two, three. Hosanna. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you feel like you were there, don't you? I love it. Well, we're, we're talking about Palm Sunday, and it's, it's Palm Sunday as in, like, it's the anniversary of Palm Sunday, but the first one. Let's go back and talk about the first one. You might remember, I, I preached a couple weeks ago about Jesus at Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus, or Jesus had gone through the city, had all kinds of followers around him, all kinds of people that were excited to, to hear Jesus teach and be with him. And that's why Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus, because he was surrounded by people, and Zacchaeus was short. So Jesus goes to his house. Well, when he leaves that house, the crowd is still with him. Everyone's pumped, and they, we know that as he left that house, he, he was about a week before Passover. Passover is the big, huge Jewish uh, uh, festival, a uh, holiday, and it, is, it, it happens every spring. The people uh, are in a big festive party mood. It's all big celebration, and God required, in the law of God, he required that all Jewish males in the country come together for a celebration three times a year. And Passover was, was that first one. That was, the, that was this big celebration. So the families would have all these special foods. You see right in the center of the picture that I gave you, uh, a little plate with six items on it. And those, those were six symbolic items. And we'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a second. But since everybody's required to go, like since all the males, all Jewish males were required to go, then of course their families went. People back in the day, there's no, um, no planes, trains, or automobiles. So they were walking those dusty roads. And, and while they would go, and this is, this is just hundreds and thousands of people clogging the, the little dirt roads, while they would go, they would be singing. And they didn't quite have the song yet, celebrate good times, come on! They didn't have that song yet. So you know what they sang? They sang Psalms number 120 through 134 in the Bible. Those songs, if you, uh, typically, if you look in your Bible at those psalms, you'll see right under the psalm number, it will say, this is a song written for ascent to Jerusalem. This was a song written so that people would sing it as they were going up to a festival, as they were going up to Jerusalem to gather the, 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 the capital city and the holy city where the temple of God was. And so they, they would be singing something more like, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Not the hills. My help comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Bump, 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 bump. They didn't have that part yet either. They didn't have the bump, bump thing yet. But that's, I think, Psalm 121. This is, so everyone knew those psalms, and as they were going up, these crowds of people would just be spontaneously breaking out into singing these songs of ascent, these psalms of ascent. Jerusalem was on a hill. So ascent means they're just walking up the hill. They're ascending. Songs of ascent. Pretty cool. Well, the, the, uh, to, to really dive into the Palm Sunday story, we would need to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, a lot of times, uh, the, those four biographers of Jesus Will, they will each kind of emphasize a different thing. It was, it was sort of like I recently saw a car wreck. I, I was there just you know, after the wreck happened on 167. Everything was moving super slow, so I knew there was a car wreck. And we get up there. I have never seen this before, but a car was on top 
of another car. Not, like, not fully, but like the two right wheels were up on top of the car. They must have slammed into them so hard they went on top of it. Well, that's what I emphasized. But another person, uh, this really happened about two weeks ago, uh, I, I, 167 northbound. Someone else telling that same story might say, you would not believe it, man. The traffic was backed up for miles. The fire truck was blocking all the lanes except for one on 167. And they, they might talk about the crowds and the emergency people. You see how it's the same thing. No one's lying. I, I'm just leaving some stuff out because I'm just telling you what was important to me or was impactful to me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did that same thing. And they kind of wrote for different purposes, and that, that, that also affected what things they included. So today, I wish I could just say, go to this one passage, but I, I really, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. My main one is Matthew 21. So if you want to go there, I, I, I welcome you to read the story for yourself, but I'm going to bounce around a little bit and get this detail from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we'll go, uh, we'll go this way and that. So it's pretty, in, uh, pretty um, important that as Jesus was heading to Jerusalem, he gets to the hill that is just outside of Jerusalem called the Mount of Olives. And he gets there, and there is this town, and I, for years, I have pronounced it my, my little American way, Bethphage. Bethphage. That's what it looks like to me. But I, I, did, I went to my little software and found out that it's actually more like Bethphage. Close? My Hebrew scholar in the front row? That might be Aramaic, I don't know. But anyway, so I just, I just, I just, I love language. I just wanted to say it right one time. Okay, so he went to Bethphage, and he, he gets there, and Jesus does something a, a little bit unusual, and he speaks prophetically, and he's got all this crowd of people with him that, remember, they've, they've come from Jericho, from Zacchaeus' house, and probably other people have joined them along the way, and Jesus says to, to two of his disciples, hey, guys, come here, come here. I want you to go ahead of us to this, this village that's just right ahead of us. When you enter the village, you're going to see a couple of donkeys tied up. A donkey, a mama donkey, and its colt tied up right next to each other. And, and, and uh, in, in Matthew 21, verse 2, uh, Jesus says, Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks what you are doing, just say, The Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. So picture in that day, a donkey would have been almost like a tractor or a truck, like that value to them. So imagine Jesus saying, go ahead uh, to this village, and there you will find two Ford pickups, a 350 and a 150, that, uh, that are parked there. Bring them to me. Like, that's crazy. This is a big deal. So Jesus prophesies and says, like, they haven't got to this, this village yet, but he says, when you go in, this is what you're going to see. Bring me those two donkeys. In Luke's version of the story in Luke 19, Luke's version says that the owner said, what? Hey, what are you guys doing with those donkeys? You can't take our donkeys. You can't just untie our donkeys and take them. And they said, the Lord needs them. And they just let them go. It was, it was really uh, already just really something really cool is going on here. So they brought those donkeys to Jesus. And the disciples laid their, they, like they took off their outer robes. I, I picture like for us today, maybe it'd be like their coats. They took off their coats and they put them on the colt, the littler donkey. And Jesus rode on them. So he, I, I don't know, if, you know, I picture Jesus in his robes. Was he side saddle? I don't know. Was he like strapping over? The, I don't know. But he's on this donkey covered in coats. And uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus rode into town. Now, this is really interesting uh, and important that Jesus is the king of all kings. We know that. And, and the, his disciples knew he was a king. I don't think they quite got to what extent, uh, but they knew that he was the coming king. And a king has two ways to ride into a, a town. He can ride in on a war horse, and that tells everybody, I am coming to take this place. Or he can ride in on a donkey, and that symbolized, I am coming in peace. Jesus, the king of all kings, rides in on a donkey, saying, I'm coming to bring peace. 
So good. I wasn't going to go here, but in, in prayer gathering this morning, Pastor Tori brought this, and she, she just mentioned that, uh, that in this story, Jesus, when he gets there, he starts weeping. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you would only know the way of peace, but you didn't pay attention when your king came. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So Jesus comes in peace. It's also significant, and I had never seen this before. I saw this in my study this week, that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on this donkey. And we're going to talk more about you know, what that was like and everything. But it parallels in reverse direction when King David, one of the early kings of Israel, had to leave Israel. Uh, he had to leave Jerusalem because his son staged a coup. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm the king now. And David left, and everyone's weeping. So they leave with weeping on foot. David gets to the Mount of Olives. Someone brings him two donkeys. And then he goes from there, and a little bit later, David, of course, was God's king, so God brought him back eventually. But David's trusted advisor, Ahithophel, saw Oh, I tried to sell out King David, and this is now coming back on me. He goes and hangs himself. And if you know the Easter story, that is Jesus' story. So he comes to the Mount of Olives, and he gets these two donkeys at the Mount of Olives. And he starts going the other way. And now the crowd is not weeping. Now they're rejoicing. It's very powerful. It's really very symbolic what Jesus is doing. And so Jesus, son of David rides back in to Jerusalem. Super cool. I love this. And he, he is fulfilling a prophecy uh, in, the, in the Old Testament section of the Bible, big, pretty big section. There's a section of prophets, and one of those prophets, uh, prophets' writings, and one of those is Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, this is what he wrote hundreds of years before Jesus came. Rejoice, O people of Zion, that's, that is it's a name for Jerusalem. It's also kind of extended to a name for, for Israel. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And here's Jesus coming in, fulfilling the prophecy from hundreds of years previous. And it's so cool that when King David, earlier king of Israel, introduced his son Solomon as king, do you know what he did? He said there was a little trouble in the kingdom, and, and he says to his, his commanders, David says, put Solomon on my donkey, send him down there to this certain city, and have him crowned king. So there again, Solomon is ushered in as a king as, as, uh, on a donkey. The people around Jesus are saying, we want the days of Solomon back. Because that was the day there were no enemies, there were no wars, there was only prosperity and peace and expansion. And so you have the people of Israel who are oppressed under the Roman Empire they had come in and occupied Jerusalem. And these people were saying, bring back Solomon again. We want the days of Solomon again, back when it was all prosperous and peace. And it's just kind of interesting to me that Solomon was introduced on a donkey. And here's Jesus coming in on a donkey as well. So he's fulfilling these prophecies. John's version of this story says, and Jesus' followers the people that were walking around Jesus as they're entering Jerusalem, they're heading there not for Palm Sunday. They don't know, there was no Palm Sunday. This was the first one. They're heading there for Passover. Okay, so they're getting ready. Passover's in a few days later, this Jewish feast. It's a very meaningful feast, too. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So uh, Jesus' followers, you know what they're talking about? The fact that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And that's an, another, another story that, that happened uh, previously. One, one of Jesus' miracles, he raised a guy from the dead who had been dead four days, and he was in the tomb. His name was Lazarus. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth, and he is alive. 
And that is, Jesus has done a lot of miracles. He's multiplied food, he's walked on water, but that is amazing to people that he raised someone from the dead. And the people in the crowds had seen it. They were there. There were crowds there when Jesus did that. There were weepers and mourners. Oh, Lazarus is dead. There's a lot of people there when Jesus raised him from the dead. And they're, they're talking about it. And people are excited. They're already excited about Passover. And now they're like, oh my goodness, this is not just any Passover. We're, we're going to. The king is here. The Messiah is here. They're like, could, could this be the Messiah? Who's going to do more miracles than, than what Jesus is doing? People were, were coming out of their homes hearing the commotion and saying, what is going on? And they're joining this crowd, and they're saying, it's Jesus, the, the one who raised someone from the dead. In, in Matthew 21, 8 and 9, it says that people started spreading their coats out on the road in front of Jesus' donkey, and others were cutting down palm branches, hence the, that's why we're playing with our palm branches today, and they laid their coats and they laid their palm branches on the road in front of Jesus. Now, you, I want you to know this. Palm branches are not part of Passover. There actually is another festival, another Jewish festival, the Festival of Shelters, where God commanded you go out and cut branches from palm trees and other, other trees, and you make a shelter. And it's symbolic. It means a lot of kind of stuff. But, but one thing that it means is that God is going to shelter with you. So you have here the Passover. This was not planned. They start getting palm branches. Woo, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's so symbolic. And God was there. He was coming to shelter with them, to tabernacle with them. So amazing. So what they were doing by laying it on the ground, it's like they were laying out the red carpet. You know how today, like that's the, you know, for the celebrities, you lay out the red carpet, or for the president, or for the Grammys, or the, the, the Oscars, or whatever, they lay out the red carpet. That's what they were doing. They were making this dusty road, no more dust, because it's all covered with all, the, all these, you know, all these items that they were throwing down. They were making it awesome for Jesus to come in. In Luke chapter 19, 38 to 40, it says that the festival crowd started shouting, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. So to us, we might think, oh, it just sounds like nice words of praise, but those were, those were uh, they were saying something. They're saying the Messiah has come. The, this promised one, we knew there would come an, a king of the of the uh, a descendant of of David, which is why they call him son of David. It means descendant of David. We that was promised that he would come. Zechariah and a lot of other prophets had prophesied that he would come, and so all of a sudden they realize he's here. This is a big deal. Can you imagine waiting for someone for thousands of years and all of a sudden he's here? That is amazing. And, and so everyone's shouting, praise God and glory to God in the highest, Hosanna. They're just, they're praising Jesus. But verse 39, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd, these were, these were religious leaders. So, some, some Pharisees said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. They shouldn't be calling you the Messiah. They shouldn't be calling you God's son. They shouldn't be praising you. And look at Jesus' response, verse 40. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Jesus is saying, creation is made to praise God. And we, that's why we praise God. That's what, when we gather, we shout, we pray, we sing. That, we do it because we are made to do that. Back to Matthew chapter 21, verse 9 to 11, Jesus was in the center of this procession. So it was a big parade. It was just a big gathering of people. And the people all around him were shouting, praise God, Hosanna is, is the, actual, the actual word. We, it's translated praise God in our, in our Bibles because that saying, save us now, God, became an exclamation of praise. All right, so it's right to translate it, praise God, but underneath it, that root word is Hosanna. Hosanna for the son of David. And this was the verse. I, a week ago, I was debating between two messages. Mm, should I do Palm Sunday, like really emphasize it or uh, preach on something else? This sentence is what got me. Verse 10, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. 
And I just say, Jesus, make Auburn in an uproar as you enter in, in power. May, may people be so affected, so impacted by you that we're literally in an uproar, a positive uproar, because your presence has come into our city. Who is this? They were asking. Verse 11, and the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So the amazing thing is, and I've already said so many amazing things, but now I'm actually going to get to the amazing thing I wanted to emphasize. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. Someone bring in lunch. The amazing thing is that Jesus rode into, Jer into Jerusalem. We believe it was on Lamb Selection Day, the 10th uh, tenth day of the Jewish uh, month of Nisan. And this is the day that the lambs, literal lambs, were brought into Jerusalem, getting ready for Passover just a few days later, four days later. Now, what's Passover? Back in Exodus 12, so in the Old Testament time, we find the story of where God's people, Israel, were enslaved. They were slaves in another country in Egypt. They were beaten down. They were harshly treated. It was horrible. But God said, I'm going to deliver you and bring you out of bondage. Very significant. God wants to bring you out of bondage. So he commanded each family to choose an unblemished lamb. And he told them, this is God's command. Bring it to, bring it to your house and take special care of it for four days. Something big's coming, the Passover. And I don't know if you know the story about when God brought the people out of Egypt, but he, he did it through a, a, a ten plagues. And he, he, he brought this variety of plagues on, e, on Egypt saying, let my people go. They, you're not going to hold them in bondage anymore. Let them go to worship me. And the last plague was the plague of death of every firstborn uh, in, the, in the households of Egypt. But God said, you're not going to die. You're my people, Israel. I'm going to take care of you. And this is, what, this is what God said to do. Take that perfect, unblemished lamb, sacrifice it to me, eat a meal for yourself, and take the blood and put it on the outside of your front door frame, on the outside. And God said, when I send the last plague, that plague of death, of every firstborn, the angel of death is going to pass through, and when he sees the blood, he will pass over your house. <sighs> that is so great. It's so symbolic. And so the blood of the lamb would be applied to the outside of every doorpost. And when the death angel was coming through the city, he said, I'm going to skip over that because the blood has been applied. Can you see what that points to Jesus' blood? So Passover is such, such a big, big deal. So Jesus rides into Jerusalem, we believe, on Lamb Selection Day. When each the, 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 the shepherds outside the city would be bringing the lambs in, each family would go choose a lamb, bring it home, make sure that it truly was unblemished, that it was a worthy offering for God, and to take special care of it for four days. And then on Passover, Jesus was crucified. Now, I have read so many articles, and every, every year at Easter, I, I read different ones, or I read them again, and the chronology is, it is really hard to figure out. But I, there are some interesting things. In Jewish culture, the day starts at 6 p.m.-ish. It starts at sundown. So Passover would start Thursday night at sundown, and all day the next day until the next sundown, that is all one day. So it was Jesus crucified on Thursday, on Friday. We would say Friday. <laughs> they would probably say, well, that's on that one day. It's on the 14th day of Nisan, which is Passover. So Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb, is hung on the cross and dies on Passover. It's so symbolic and so amazing what Jesus did. He became the ultimate Passover lamb for us. He sacrificed his life so that he could save us from death. He died so we could live. And so when you accept Jesus' blood sacrifice for your sins, he, he died 
to take the punishment for our sins, when you accept that, he took that punishment. When you say, I want to appropriate, I want to receive what you did for me, the death angel passes over your life. Passes over. Your body may die, but your spirit will live forever with God in heaven. So death has no effect on you. It's actually a doorway. If you're a, a believer in Jesus, it's actually a doorway to heaven. And so it's, it's awesome. The death angel passes over you. So the good news is that Jesus loves you sacrificially. He loves you sacrificially. Here's why that matters. You don't have to defend your worth. You don't have to earn love anymore. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to achieve something. You don't have to prove. You don't have to deserve Jesus' love. He loved you before you did anything good or bad. His love is, does not depend on your performance. He already loved you. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11 is such a powerful, powerful, it's a little long, but it's just, it's so good. Here we go. Let's jump in there. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time. Yes, he did. He came at Passover and at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Like, I don't want to go around dying. That's not, not a thing. I, who wants to do that? He, although some, someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Think about that. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We were not especially good. No one's willing to die for someone like that except God. Verse 9, and since we have been made right in God's sight, God declares us right by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. That is God's plan, that none of us experience punishment, none of us experience condemnation. Verse 10, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies... We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Our sin, every one of us is born into sin. That's our condition. And that sin makes us an enemy of God. And, and we're, we're learning here that Jesus uh, said, I want you as my friends. And so his blood, when it's applied to our lives, we become friends of God. So verse 11, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. So that's so awesome. It's so great. What gets in the way of that? Why, why do we sometimes have such trouble believing that we are friends of God? Why do you sometimes have trouble believing you're a friend of God? God calls you his friend. Hey, friend, God sees. Well, maybe it's, you're suspicious whenever anyone's nice to you. Because of your past? Because of your thoughts? Or maybe you've had your heart broken by someone who said they loved you and they left. And so then, uh, it, it's hard to believe that anyone would be committed to you because that person wasn't. Or maybe you felt guilty or ashamed because of something you've done or some things you've done. You messed up again. And so you distance yourself from others because, just simply because you're ashamed. You're, you're, your eyes are down. Or maybe you feel insecure because you notice everybody else's good points. Thank you, Facebook. And all you see are your bad points. But Jesus has proven his love for you by offering himself on a cross. That's, that's proof. And that love of Jesus transforms you from the inside out. What could happen if you would choose instead to change your focus and rejoice in your wonderful new relationship with God? What if that was your focus? In other words, what if you could begin to act like you're a friend of God? So when someone says or does something nice for you, you might actually then accept it with a smile because you already feel loved. So not arrogantly, but just like someone gives you a compliment, you go, well, thank you. I'm, I'm a worthy person because God has made me worthy. Or you might in turn, offer a compliment or do something nice for somebody else just because you want to spread the love around. 
you might decide to be the committed one because you realize Jesus' love for you, he's committed to you regardless of your performance. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. So you might go, you know what? I know other people have broken my heart, but I'm going to be the committed one. I'm going to be the committed friend. I'm going to be the committed spouse. I'm going to be the committed worker. I don't know what everybody else is doing around me, but Jesus loves me. I can be committed. Do you see how it would be transforming from the inside out? Knowing you are right with God can empower you to start looking people in the eye again. You rise her up. When you feel secure in your identity, do you hear that word? When you feel secure in your identity as a cherished friend of God, you gain new confidence to try out for that new job or, or that new relationship or that new ministry. You, it, something changes inside you. And if I could just wrap up this whole message in one phrase, it would be this. Jesus' sacrificial love transforms your heart. Jesus' sacrificial love for you transforms your heart. He loves you just as you are. He loves you enough to die in your place. He loves you enough to not also leave you just as you are. He loves you as you are, but he's not going to leave you there. He's going to help you be uh, all that he created you to be. As you become an apprentice of Jesus, you become more and more like him. So I just want to challenge you today. Let Jesus' love, his sacrificial love, transform your heart from the inside out. Would you stand to your feet? And let's pray. And let's just start by thanking Jesus for his love. Would you do that? Would you bow your heads with me? And let's just pray online. Pray with us. Let, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Lord, thank you for being our Passover lamb. Thank you, Lord, for laying down your life. Thank you that while I was a sinner, you loved me and you loved us, Lord. Thank you that while we were our sin made us enemies of God, you made us friends of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. May your love fill our hearts and our motives and our intentions. May your love impact all our relationships, Lord. Make us new. Make us new. Lord, help us to look people in the eye again. Lord, help us to have confidence in you, in your love. Help us to choose, make the good choices, Lord. Transform our hearts, Lord. Transform our hearts from the inside out, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you're a transformer. Thank you, Lord. You transform us. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. With your head still bowed uh, in this atmosphere of prayer, I just want to give you an opportunity to put your faith in Jesus. Become his apprentice. Get a new life today that lasts forever. Step out from under the weight of God's condemnation. And step into the relationship of friendship with God. Don't you want that? Why wouldn't anybody want that? And today, if you're not sure you're a Christian, you're not sure you're a follower of Jesus, you're not sure you're forgiven, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus to save you. Save you from what? From the sin and its penalties. Save you from God's condemnation. How do you do that? Turn from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. Do you want to do that today? Do you want to become a Christian today? Maybe you're coming back to Jesus after a time away. Would you just raise your hand if today you want to put your faith in Jesus? Yep, I see some hands going up, but that is so cool. Some people feeling like you're coming back to, Lord, to the Lord. Some people coming to him for the first time online. I can't see you through the screen, but God can see you. He is with you where you are. Why don't you raise your hand to God too? And, and let me just coach you in a prayer, how to put your faith in Jesus. It's not the only, like these are not magic words. It's just a way to pray. Would you repeat after me? And if you're making uh, Jesus your savior today, would you pray these words straight to God? But let's all pray together. Jesus, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Could we welcome people to the kingdom of God for putting their faith in Jesus? Woo! We celebrate. We celebrate with you today. 
And if Jesus is transforming your heart, if you just raised your hand or if you just prayed that prayer, we've got an online course for you following Jesus. And I really want to encourage you to take that course. So I'll hand it over to Pastor Christian. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor Garen. You know, you breathe such new insight into that passage. I I feel like I learned a lot that I'd never heard about before. So thank, thank you for that and revealing those truths to us. Well, for all of you, we're so glad you came today. Um, If you filled out that Connect card, would you please just pop that in the box in the back on your way out? If you haven't filled it out, now's your chance. And um, also remember, so right after serve, right now, we're going to be, right now, (laughs) we're going to be having our serve team meeting. So please, if you can serve next week during Easter or especially the Easter carnival, please stay after. We're going to have a short meeting just to share how the day is going to go, the positions that we need to fill, whether that's um, helping at a game booth, being a greeter, um, set up, tear down. There's a ton of stuff for every, every gift, every talent. We need you. Amen. All right. And then also groups, no groups this week. Groups start in two weeks. All right. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Yep, see you at 9.30 and 11 next week. God bless.